Good evening, and welcome to our first ever digital only edition of UW Now. I'm Mike Knetter, president of the Wisconsin Foundation and Alumni Association. We wish our foray into digital events was naturally occurring. Of course, COVID-19 has infected people near and far and has impacted our daily lives in ways that we could not have imagined. The cancellation of all gatherings and our desire to still bring you timely and relevant information from faculty experts has pushed us into this new space, and we are quite certain it will become a permanent part of our event milieu. While many things are uncertain today, we can be confident that when we emerge from this pandemic, we will have a deeper appreciation for science, our great research universities, and our alumni communities. At WAA, we are committed to ensuring UW-Madison will thrive into the future. There's likely to be a learning curve for these events, so please bear with us. Our format is quite simple. I will introduce our distinguished guest. She will share brief remarks about her work, and we will open it up to questions from our audience. If you wish to ask a question, simply submit a comment through YouTube's chat feature. Our guest this evening is Dr. Nazia Safdar. Dr. Safdar received her MD at Aga Khan University in her native Pakistan before coming to UW-Madison to earn a master's in population health and a PhD in clinical research. Today, she is a professor in the Division of Infectious Diseases, vice chair for research in the Department of Medicine, and medical director of infection control at UW hospitals and clinics. Among her many professional accolades, one that stands out in particular is a president's early career award for scientists and engineers for her work on identifying, testing, and implementing interventions to prevent or reduce healthcare associated infections. Obviously, preventing the spread of infection in healthcare facilities has taken on incredible urgency today. Nasia, Thank you for doing such important work to help others. Please share a bit about your role in these challenging times. Thank you very much for the opportunity to talk about COVID-19 today. With this global pandemic now in the US with almost 200,000 cases reported and 4,000 deaths, what I'll be talking about today is the preparedness of the health system to try and blunt the tide of what we think will be an inevitable impact of this in Wisconsin as well. Currently, Wisconsin has about 1,300 cases, and so we are have not approached peak for the pandemic here in our state yet. Uh, this is the time to prepare and make sure that we are ready for when it does. Uh, I'll be talking with my slides, so if we could have the slides up. This is what the current state of cumulative total COVID-19 cases. Uh, this is yesterday's data, so you can see that the trajectory of cases in Wisconsin is quite steep. This is of course only a snapshot and a subset of the total cases because many, as is the case in other states as well, many individuals with mild symptoms are not being tested to see if COVID-19 is responsible for their symptoms. A little encouraging news is that with the effect of social distancing that has been put into place, this is data from Dane County Public Health website where the report that if you see on the top of the slide, the example of clusters early in the outbreak was that one individual who was infected had contact with many individuals, thereby rendering it very difficult to maintain the isolation and the quarantine that is necessary to prevent transmission in the community. At the lower part of the slide, you see the clusters that they're seeing now is that each case has far fewer contacts, and this is one effective intervention that we can do to stem the tide in our state. Next slide. What is UW-Madison doing to help the health systems as well as the state and the community learn about COVID-19 and prepare for it? This is the website of the American Family Insurance Data Science Institute at UW, where a group of over 100 individuals are feverishly working not just to curate the literature that's out there, but to prepare models and projections in order to be able to effectively tell us what we can expect and what sort of preparedness is necessary. This is one example. Another is a collaboration between UW Health, UW Engineering, and Population Health Sciences to create projections for health system needs for surge planning. 
This is very important, of course, because the health system needs to know what to expect in terms of ICU preparedness, ventilator support that may be necessary, and non-ICU hospitalized patients. As we are learning from other states, it seems that no amount of preparation can be too much. Next slide. This is what we see from nationwide, some states that have put in place a spectrum of social distancing measures. As I was preparing for this talk, I happened to look up the influenza guidelines from the CDC from almost 10 years ago, and the intervention that they had listed as being most effective for reducing spread of influenza was social distancing. However, nobody really practiced it until this pandemic appeared. And I think it's just, we're comfortable with influenza because we see it every year and we sort of know what to expect. But with a pandemic where no one has any immunity, no one has seen it before, and the outcomes are uncertain and fearful, I think that it has led people to practice social distancing in a more rigorous manner, which is essential and necessary, and really the only effective tool that we have at this point in the absence of a vaccine, vaccine or any other therapeutic measures. Next slide. How do we get people to buy into social distancing, I think is a challenge that many states are are facing. It is definitely a culture shift for many people and there are understandable concerns about the effect of it on financial uh, aspects, on the economy, on the ability to be um, moving about with people and so on. Uh, there is a group that is has written extensively about the factors that are important to change behavior because social distancing and physical distancing is really a behavioral change. It's making it uh, making people capable of doing it. So realizing what you have to do to promote social distancing, that it has to be the six feet distance and a way to measure that effectively so that you know when you're practicing it. It's the opportunity that's created in the form of the orders that have come out from the state to allow people to engage in that without feeling that they're doing something that is not recommended. And finally, it's the motivation that's necessary. And I think the motivation that people are are using now is we see a frightening number of cases around us and that has led people to practice this in a very rigorous manner. Next slide. And if you're not motivated enough, this should make you motivated. The aerosolization from a cough or sneeze can travel several feet, and that's the basis for the recommendation that you have to maintain a six foot distance from the individual who might potentially be infected. While we don't know the full impact of asymptomatic transmission and the contribution of that towards the spread, of COVID-19, it is safe to assume that at least a certain proportion of the population is asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic because we've seen those cases come out in the literature and there is some element of them being able to transmit the condition. So the social distancing helps with that as well. Next slide. The main route of transmission for COVID-19 is droplet transmission. So infected individuals cough or sneeze, these droplets are fairly large in size, they remain in the air briefly, but because of their size, they drop to the ground. Therefore, the social distancing measures that have been proposed are likely to work. There is a small proportion of instances in which transmission is also airborne, which is when an aerosolizing procedure is being done, such as an intubation or surgery or a bronchoscopy, when the size of the particles are, are small enough that it remains in the air and then causes airborne transmission. The third route is also direct or indirect contact with a contaminated environment. So if an infected individual touches their immediate environment and somebody who's not infected happens to touch that contaminated environment and then takes their hand to their nose or their mouth is another mechanism of transmission. Next slide. One thing that came on early that I'm sure everyone that's listening to this has been aware of is the diagnostic challenges that the entire country faced when, when COVID-19 first started appearing here. Um, there was um, a lot of issues with not just the test itself, but also supply chain in terms of the reagents, in terms of the swabs that are used to collect specimens. And it led to real delays in our understanding of what was the impact of COVID-19 in a particular region. You couldn't really get a good estimate of the burden and the prevalence of this virus in the population because we could only test a subset of all of those who had symptoms and all of those in the community. Um, this is one example of UW professors, David O'Connor and Tom Friedrich, who have really taken up this challenge of developing a new diagnostic test. And while it's not at the point where it can be used as a commercial test in a clinical laboratory, it was very instrumental early on as we struggled to understand who are the people that we should isolate, what does mild symptoms mean in COVID-19, and what other conditions that might be circulating around 
that also make it challenging to distinguish whether an individual is suffering from COVID-19, a common cold virus, or influenza. Next slide. One of the ways that we have to protect healthcare workers in the health system from contracting COVID-19 from other healthcare workers, and particularly from patients, is the use of personal protective equipment. This is a snapshot of what personal protective equipment looks like when you are trying to uh, combat um, a virus, such as in this case, uh, the novel coronavirus. The usual scenario for personal protective equipment, or PPE, is that all the elements that you see here on this slide are disposable. You use them one time, you assume that they are contaminated now because you've been engaged in care of the patient and you discard them. It would be great if that was still the case, but as we all know, nationwide and worldwide, there are immense shortages of personal protective equipment. And those shortages have forced infection prevention personnel to make recommendations that they would not otherwise do in the usual state. So reusing respirators, reusing face shields, reusing gowns by laundering them are all things that we do in contingency situations or as we're seeing now in crisis situations for some states. Next slide. Recently, there was an article about how healthcare workers can stretch their personal protective equipment. And the way that this is done is that there are several categories of things that you can do. You can reclaim things that are otherwise not used as personal protective equipment because they're not used in the healthcare environment, such as respirators that are used in construction, for example, and use them for that purpose. You can reuse your N95 respirator by storing it when you're done with one particular patient and then taking it into the same room or a different room the next time that you use it with the idea that you keep using it as long as you're reasonably certain that there is integrity of, of that mask. You can repurpose things that you would otherwise not do. And some of you may have seen in the press, there has been interest in creating masks made out of materials that we normally would not use, um, such as fabrics of different types. You can reduce the use of personal protective equipment, which is something that all health systems are doing by postponing elective clinic visits, elective surgeries, elective procedures, to be able to reduce the volume that would require individuals to use personal protective equipment. And the last thing is, of course, to create a new personal protective equipment from whatever materials come to hand. All of these challenges are new in this pandemic because I think no one fully understood or anticipated the effect that this would have on countries, on the supply chain, and on our ability to take care of patients. This is an example on the right of an N95 respirator. This is designed to be used for a single use, and yet what most health systems are finding themselves having to do is to ask the healthcare workers to take their respirator, store it in a paper bag or in a breathable container, and then reuse it the next time that they have to take care of that patient. This is not to say that the N95 respirator may not work in that setting. It may very well may. It's just a departure from my usual practices and from infection control recommendations. Next slide. For those who are interested in the relative effectiveness of different materials that people have been making masks out of, you can see in this study that looked at the effectiveness of household materials compared with a surgical mask against one micron particles to be able to see what the effectiveness of of those materials was. So vacuum cleaner bags, for instance, are remarkably close to the surgical mask material. Everything else falls below quite a bit. Um, and when you come to household fabrics, you notice that the effectiveness drops quite substantially. Next slide. So one way to protect the healthcare worker's mask is to wear it with a face shield, with the idea that the face shield will catch whatever droplets or respiratory secretions are emitted from the patient, and then the face shield is cleanable. However, early on when we started preparing for COVID-19, we realized that there was a shortage of face shields as well. And this is another example of the Wisconsin idea where UW Engineering came to the rescue and manufactured the Badger Shield, which is a face shield that looks identical to what a healthcare worker would use in the normal situation and is able to protect the mask by covering it during times of direct patient care. This has led to us being more comfortable now with reusing the masks, recognizing that the face shield is protecting it. Without it, I think it's very difficult to, to protect our PPE from aerosolization. The other PPE that we are in short supply of is uh, paper hoods, and paper is a type of device that you can see in the slide there. The hoods are not as hard to manufacture, but the machinery and the rest of the equipment because it filters air that is going to the healthcare worker's um, nose and mouth, 
and is a desirable thing to use in the case of situations where the risk of aerosolization is high. This is also an area of active work by UW Engineering, and we're very grateful for the partnership and the, and the responsiveness. Next slide. Happy to take questions and comments. Great. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Safdar. Um, we, we have a question that came in, and I understand you had experience with the first COVID case that was diagnosed here in Madison. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about your experience with that case, what made you suspect it, and also how long was it until we had a second case? It seems to me that there was quite a length of time between our first and second cases. Our first case was at the end of January. The individual had traveled back from China and they had several family members who were ill, some of whom were later confirmed to have uh, the novel coronavirus infection. So I think based on their reporting of events and their activities in China, as well as our understanding of how COVID-19 spreads, I think the level of suspicion in the emergency department was very high. And so they were able to prevent any transmissions to anyone else by immediately placing a mask on the individual uh, placing them in a room and providing them the, the required care. I think we were, and the patient was, I think, lucky in that instance that their symptoms were mild. They did not require hospitalization. They went home and recovered without any sequelae, which, which was wonderful. So it was an early run for us to see whether, in fact, we were prepared or not to be able to handle somebody who comes into the emergency department without knowing in, um, beforehand that they had COVID-19. Our second case did not appear for several weeks later but I think that early experience allowed us to at least get a glimpse of what our preparation needed to look like. We've got an audience question from Chris who wants to know what we know about the development of long-term immunity after someone recovers from COVID-19. So, you know, all of our estimates, I think are based on what we know about other respiratory viruses, which is that there is some immunity. Uh, it's for a variable period of time, for example, influenza, but there's likely to be some. This has led to um, the, the thinking that perhaps if convalescent plasma could be delivered to patients who have COVID-19 as a therapeutic measure, it may help those individuals. So that's currently under development. We don't yet know how long the immunity will last. Those studies are underway, but we don't have that data yet. Okay, another audience question from Don. Uh, when would you predict that the virus will peak in the Madison area? So I think those estimates have changed from, from the early time when we first started seeing cases. And I think that is in large part due to the effect of social distancing and the fact that we believe it's working. So the initial peak was felt to be sometime in mid to late April. And I think most modeling projections are now showing that it's actually been pushed out to May and has been blunted by the effect of social distancing. Of course, whether the projections meet the actuals, we still have to see, but those, those models have, have shown that. Um, a question that maybe relates to your own area of research expertise, how do we keep non-COVID patients safe at our hospitals during this pandemic? So we have a couple of ways to approach that. One is to ensure that non-COVID patients that enter the health system do so only when there really is a clear need for them to come in person to the health system. A number of visits have been converted to telemedicine or phone visits. And as long as that meets the patient care needs, that's an excellent way to make sure that we don't inadvertently expose patients to COVID-19. For those that do need to come into the health system, we would limit their exposure to those with respiratory illness by having different waiting areas, different clinics providing care and, and uh, making sure that we don't allow people to co-mingle or to wait in waiting areas without sufficient distance between patients. Uh, audience question from Ted, who was wondering if you could comment on the epidemiological modeling that has been released and whether we create our own models for Wisconsin, the United States, and the world, or whether you draw upon other models, uh, and if so, which ones? So I think the collaboration that is going on both in the Data Science Institute and this other group between Engineering UW Health and Population Health is doing a bit of both. We are drawing upon what we're learning from other countries and other states, but also using local data to look at the, uh, the validity of the projections that we are making. 
I think that there are a number of models out there. They all have to make some assumptions as they project data. Sometimes those assumptions are different between models. And so we, we look to all of them, we follow them, we keep track of them, but ultimately we develop our own informed from our own local situation. Do you have any sense of what the fatality rates, the best estimates of fatality rates are today of COVID-19 in a population like we find in the United States? So the best estimate of, of case fatality that we're seeing is 1%, but that is likely to be an overestimate because very few people are tested and the ones that are tested are those with moderate illness who also have a higher likelihood of succumbing to COVID-19. So it's likely that the true fatality rate is lower than 1%. You may have seen reports from other countries reporting a higher fatality rate, but a lot of that is dependent upon who gets tested. Those with mild symptoms are expected to recover without any sequelae, and those are not the people that are getting tested. Hmm. Thank you. Uh, question from Tawny. How long do you think we'll need to practice social distancing uh, in the United States? I guess the answer is as long as we have to. We don't quite know what the trajectory of this pandemic will be as the weather changes and the seasons change. And I think we are all hopeful that as it gets warmer, there will be a dip in COVID-19 and it, it may or may not have a resurgence in the fall. But I think we can't really make a timeline for this. In the past, in literature, when others have tried it, there has usually been a second wave or a resurgence of cases when social distancing has, has, has let up. So at the moment, I would say we definitely need to continue for some time. And a question from Edward, he wonders, how are UW-Madison researchers collaborating with people at other major research universities to leverage knowledge and work and resources? I think one of the advantages of the digital technology is that there is a Slack channel now for everything. And the Slack channel incorporates people no matter where in the world they may be. The same thing with virtual meetings and, and trying to understand what others are doing. For my own health system preparedness, I can say that we have spoken to far too many health systems to really even count to compare how they're preparing for the pandemic, what they're feeling when they're in the throes of it, what could we be doing differently to prepare and how can we all support each other with PPE. Of course, the Department of Public Health here um, is also a valuable partner in this regard and the CDC's guidance is always welcome as well. You know, in this period where we're um, not allowed to have gatherings and restaurants are closed, it's become very popular to encourage people to still, um, you know, patronize local uh, restaurants by eating out. Uh, Hannah wonders, why is eating takeout still okay? And couldn't there still be a risk that the person preparing the food could spread the virus to the person eating the food or possibly even through the delivery? Uh, so I think through the delivery, I would say that, you know, we've we've been talking about what methods might prevent us from contracting COVID-19 and something that is essential and fundamental, but yet often not articulated nearly often enough is the importance of hand hygiene. So if you were to touch something that you were worried about was contaminated, if you just did hand hygiene after touching that takeout container before you started eating, would be a very effective way to interrupt the transmission. I think the other question about, you know, could it be in the food that you're eating? Um, you know, I suppose it's plausible that if somebody were to sneeze or cough on a salad, for instance, and you ate it like that, that you could contract it. I think the risk is low because what you're ingesting uh, is going into your stomach and your stomach acid will, will get rid of it. Uh, but of course, if that's a concern, then I recommend people eat um, cooked food instead of uh, raw. Another viewer question, what is known about the various mutant strains of the SARS-CoV-2 virus? Are they distinct enough to generate different symptoms upon infection? So I haven't seen much data on this. I've seen some anecdotal reports from China that mentioned that there might be more than one strain. There doesn't appear to be a lot of uh, difference in terms of the symptoms, but there does appear to be perhaps some changes in terms of how much immunity you generate. Um, because the data is not peer reviewed and is not vetted, I, I don't think we really know at this point. Uh, question from Dory, should people be tested later to see if they have had it? There are a number of um, companies and platforms that are preparing serologic studies to be able to do those serosurveys in the community. 
and to see what the exposure was, which is a great way to determine what percent of the population was infected. I think our current challenges are that we don't know if those serologic assays are adequately sensitive and whether they will provide some understanding of what the titer of immunity is or the level of immunity is. So they're mostly qualitative. They can tell you if somebody had it or didn't have it, but anything more than that, and, and because of the sensitivity issues, it's not ready for prime time yet, in my opinion. Um, Dr. Safdar, is there anything that you think we should be doing as a matter of public health in America that we're currently not doing to try to prevent the spread of COVID-19? If, if there were one or two things you could do uh, waving a magic wand, what would you improve upon right now? I think, you know, we've talked about social distancing and of course it's being practiced, but I don't know that it's being practiced to the extent that it needs to be everywhere. It's very hard to, to limit movement of people across the borders of states and, and areas. So I think that the entire nation comes to terms with the fact that you start the social distancing well before you start to see cases, and then you have to be prepared to be able to have high fidelity to it. In other words, if you start to see very few cases, we don't say, oh, well, it must be working and therefore I don't need to do it anymore. This is hard for us, I think, as a community. But on the other hand, it's also one thing that we can do today without any equipment, without any other needs. Everyone can practice it. So it's hard to overemphasize the importance of that, but it's the only effective thing we have at this point. Do you think that's something that we need to do in concert across the entire country? I, I've heard people talk about maybe it needs to be done at different times in different locations. I think that's hard to say, but I do think that it needs to be done before you are in the throes of it. I think at that point, if you do it, yes, you might see fewer cases in the health system, but for health systems that are overwhelmed, I think it's very difficult to, to contain it at that point. I think that's the whole premise of public health. You know, if we, if we do social distancing and we don't see a huge rise in Wisconsin or a huge peak, that is a success story. Mm. Another viewer question, would having had the flu a couple months ago help with immunity against COVID-19? Um, hard to say. I, I don't think that you would want to rely on that. I think what it might tell you is that you have an immune system that is capable of mounting a defense against influenza and is likely to do the same for COVID-19. Um, but other than that, hard to say. Okay. And that same viewer wonders if COVID-19 is more deadly than the flu, and I believe you already addressed that by saying you think the fatality rate is 1%? That's correct, yeah. I think you know the, the main thing to remember is that the fatality rate, just like influenza, is higher in those who have comorbid illnesses, are vulnerable because of their immune system. And so it's uh, it has complications in that age group, but at the population level, yes, the case fatality is 1%. And I think we, um, Kathy Chazen wonders if we have immunity after contracting the virus and recovering. You may have touched on that earlier. Could you just elaborate on that? So I think it's likely that there is some immunity. What we don't know what the level of that immunity is and how long it lasts. So it could be very variable and it could wane over time. Those studies actually are underway at UW uh, as well. And so between our data and those of others around the country, I expect we'll have an answer to that. We just don't have it yet. Um, last question uh, from Kim. Should the dental industry significantly change how we care for patients with regard to PPE, personal protective equipment? I think one of the main things that we're doing in our health system and that everyone is recommending is that there is, of course, a spectrum of dental patients. There are those that need urgent care and there's no getting around that. Those people, of course, should still be provided care using PPE, but for the vast majority of routine dental visits and visits that can be postponed, I think it would be a great way to preserve PPE if we could do that. Uh, Dr. Safdar, any final closing comments you would like to offer for our audience tonight? just to say thank you for having me present and happy to be here. Well, thank you very much for all that you're doing, Dr. Safdar. We really appreciate you taking some time to speak with alumni tonight. And uh, I wanna thank our audience for their questions. Uh, we had far too many good questions to get to all of them. Um, and I, I would just ask that people continue to check our website for additional information 
about COVID-19. Um, we, we keep updating that with the latest information that we can access. And um, uh, just I'll put in a little pitch for uh, the future. Um, we will be doing these events every Tuesday night throughout the month of April. We may even add in a few more events if they're well received. Uh, but Tuesdays at 7 p.m., we'll have these UW Now live streams at 7 p.m. Central Time, recognizing many of you may be in different time zones. Uh, next week, we will hear from Kenneth Mayer, professor of political science, who will talk about the role of leadership and the federal response to the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, and with that, uh, I would just like to thank Dr. Safdar again for joining us. Thank you for all of your work uh, at the University of Wisconsin and the UW Health System. We are very grateful for what you do and uh, on Wisconsin.